Hey guys, you're about to listen to the second episode of the Shrinking Burnout Podcast, started by two psychiatrists who wanted to talk about healthcare worker burnout. I'm Andy, one of the psychiatrists who hosts this show along with Varsha. I wanted to say a few words before we get the show going. We've recorded this episode with our guest Sarah in the last week of April 2020. In Boston, we've just gone past the peak of predicted COVID hospitalizations. Some places in the U.S. have already partially lifted some of the stay-at-home orders. In this episode, Sarah talks about a hypothetical, apocalyptic situation where healthcare workers are so stressed that they quit, don't take care of their physical or mental health, and are at increased risk of suicide. The sad reality is that this isn't a hypothetical situation for some doctors. Even before the pandemic, clinician burnout has been rising the subsequent costs on clinician health has been increasing. Like our guest John mentioned last week, hospitals have had to adapt to this pandemic. A lot of healthcare workers have been working this entire time, sometimes in different roles than what they're used to. With a lot of these changes comes new anxieties, stress, and rising burnout. Sarah's gonna discuss how her role as a medicine resident has changed during COVID. It was a little unplanned, but we ended up having a pretty good discussion of some of the ways the healthcare system and the culture of medicine has set up doctors to burn out. I've talked enough. Here's the second episode. Next, we have another resident doctor, Sarah. Thank you for having me, Varsha and Andy. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. I'm an internal medicine resident working in one of the major cities in the Midwest. How has your experience been working through the COVID pandemic? My experience with COVID has been different than, I guess, anything I've done before. So I've primarily been working uh, outside of the COVID unit. So we take care of COVID PUIs or the patients under investigation. So typically, if the patient has one positive COVID test, they'll go to the unit If it's one negative test, they'll kind of come to our floor or ICU. So a couple of the patients in the past month and a half initially came to us negative for COVID, ended up having a second positive test. So we are still caring for COVID patients. It's been uh, okay. I feel like the hospital has done a pretty good job of trying to streamline screening and testing for it. In terms of your experience so far, have you been feeling well supported by their hospital and specifically your co-residents? I think that the residency is doing a good job of giving us more internal residents support and the chiefs are doing a good job of overseeing it. Sarah, can you tell us a little bit more about what the support looks like? Yeah. During the call day when typically you would be the sole person admitting, they have incorporated two or three extra bodies there throughout the 24 shift so that you have a buddy to help you when admissions get overwhelming. In terms of managing turnover of patients and number of admissions, how would you say that's changed during COVID versus pre-COVID? Honestly, I'd say it's probably been about the same, like with regard to the census. I've had really busy call days. I I think my busiest call day was actually probably pre-COVID. In terms of the emotional cost, what's that been like? I think that for for any resident, we all try to look for ways on our time off. For me, I like shopping or going to restaurants or spending time outdoors. And I think it's been hard to do that because you already have limited time off. And then in your limited time off, you have significantly less things that you can do. And I think that having less options definitely contributes to feeling like more lonely and bored and I would say more taxed. For example, I'm on my vacation block right now and I had plans of going on a trip with my family, you know, who lives out of state, but I'm not going home because I want to keep them safe. I was really looking forward to that. And I think that part of it is you don't really have as much to look forward to. Something that our program does is they, you know, have like a day off for all the second years or all the interns or all the third years. It's a really nice day you get to spend with your co-residents, just kind of having a nice time. Things that you are looking forward to, I think when those get, you know, taken away understandably, I think that's something that contributes even more to feeling burnt out and like overwhelmed. Sarah, can you tell us how overall resident morale has been? 
I will say our chiefs are really excellent. I think they do a really good job of accommodating people and being transparent with us. And I think that that sort of helped. I wouldn't say morale is really, really low or like anything like that, but our chiefs had sent out a survey. So only if you were a volunteer, they would pull you there. If there's a certain point where the number of volunteers like runs out or the demand exceed the number of people in the pool, people are going to be getting pulled. I put, I don't volunteer, but if you need me, then I'm happy to do it. Like that's kind of, my, that was where I was. They're pulling from that pool right now. For anybody out there that's listening that's not in the medical field, what exactly did the chiefs do with volunteering and what went into your process? It was basically just a Google form and it was like, we are opening up a separate COVID unit and we need residents to take care of patients there. If this is something that you're interested in and would like to volunteer in, please let us know. But I think that that survey was twofold. One, it was like, if you want to do it, then, you know, they will prioritize you being there. But I think the second thing is if you have an absolute contraindication, let us know so we can absolutely make sure that we do not put you there. And then the third option was you would prefer not to, but if it came to it, then would it be okay to reach out to you again, basically? Mm -hmm. I'd also be curious to hear what your experience has been so far with the mortality in the ICU and medical floors. I will say that I was pleasantly surprised in the sense that in my two weeks of ICU, I personally on my team had maybe like 10 or 11 deaths. Even if the patient does not have COVID, we're restricting visitors coming into the hospital. And I feel like a lot of these end of life discussions, a lot of the sad beauty of it is when you get to have the family there and they get to be with them and share those lost moments. And I think it's really sad that that's not something that we can necessarily do. I think our hospital does have like a policy. If a patient is made comfort care and does not have COVID, then I think you can have like two family members come in for a set amount of time, which is really sad. I think that's been the hardest part. You know, prior to all this, I've had situations where you'd have 10 or 15 loved ones be with someone as they're passing on. They're all kind of holding hands and they're embracing and it's very beautiful and bittersweet, of course. I feel sad that for the family and for the patient that they don't get to have that kind of set off. Is there a way for these patients to have their loved ones there by technology, such as with telephones or with iPads? Yeah, there's an iPad we were using to do those kind of things. But I think it was also a little bit traumatic for some family members that maybe aren't in like the medical field to see their loved one intubated and kind of sedated. and Through an iPad. Through an iPad, yeah. So I think it's probably very dehumanizing and I wish that there was a war ground, but I am thankful that at least they can see their loved ones because I imagine 20 years ago, they probably wouldn't have the technology to do that. I want to go back to your personal feeling about working during this time. Does it feel at all that it's more stressful to be working with patients that have such a contagious virus? I feel okay about it. I think what I feel the most anxious about is being like an asymptomatic carrier and then passing it on to my fiance who has asthma or to a friend that maybe has like another kind of health condition. So I think that's what worries me the most, but I'm trying to take the best precautions I can in our apartment. We have a washing machine right when you enter. So I put all my clothes there. First thing I do is I shower and I try to do those things and be cognizant of that, but I think that's the thing I'm the most worried about. And how has this time impacted your personal life? So uh, I was supposed to take step three and that got canceled. I don't know if that's good or bad. I'm still kind of on the fence about that. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I miss hugging my friends and I miss holding people's hands and just like social contact. Social contact. Yeah. (laughs) It's frustrating. Is there anything else that you feel like you'd like to tell us about? I mean, I guess the only thing that I will say is with regard to how sustainable I think things are for hospital systems, a lot of what they're going on right now is providers' goodwill. And I think that that is a finite resource. People think that it's for the good of the patient, like it's your job, like you have to do it. And I think that people will do that. And I think that people care. We do feel like a duty, but I think that it's not a sustainable thing. And I hope that this resolves 
soon because it, it's not a finite resource. Mm-hmm. What do you feel or anticipate potentially happening if people no longer feel as compelled to, you know, for lack of another word, martyr themselves? Yeah. In a, in a very extreme scenario, if someone is getting so stretched thin that they feel like they physically don't have the reserve, I imagine some people will probably quit if they can't do this anymore. I imagine some people may harm themselves. Physician suicide is a very real thing. I don't anticipate or hope that doesn't happen, but I imagine in like an apocalyptic scenario where people are getting pushed to a breaking point that they say, I can't do this anymore. I feel like the only solution, well, there's really no solution, but I think adding more people to the workforce to help balance that. But I also feel like that's tricky because then you, you're trying, you're like exposing more folks and, you know, spreading things that way too. It's like putting a bandaid on the problem, not necessarily yeah. solving the underlying issue itself. Yeah. There's a lot of systems issues in place that I feel like this pandemic is really, really exposing. Yeah, exactly. Why don't we talk a little bit about the systems issues that are at play? I feel like there's not enough providers to do the amount of work that the increasing patient load is. I think primary care is very underrated, and I think that more resources should be spent there. You know, eating well, taking care of your mental health. You know, and I kind of just feel like our healthcare system has let down a lot of patients. Yeah, yeah. One of the big things within the field is that it's hard to talk about these things because a lot of the times we bring up the notion of the Hippocratic Oath and everything that we do is for the patients. And like you were saying, it's a limited resource when patients are getting more and more complicated Mm -hmm. and physicians are getting more and more strained. Yeah, no, absolutely. I very much agree with that. Do you guys think we'll ever get to a point where we're able to talk about these issues without feeling guilty about it? I think it's going to take quite a bit of time. I think the one thing that is undeniable, I think across the world really, is the idea that we have to in some way martyr ourselves and do things that because of the nature of the profession itself does in a lot of ways become like a a form of self-sacrifice with your time, your your emotional energy, physical energy, and as you said, the expectation of goodwill, which of course all of us go into medicine wanting to do the right thing and wanting to do the good thing for our patients, but being stretched really thin is certainly not helping that and is more harmful at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of like with the quote unquote martyrdom, you can do that, but that's not sustainable. Right. And then eventually if you're like a broken person, or if you don't enjoy your job anymore, you don't feel like you want to go into work or you don't want to like take care of patients anymore, or you also don't take care of your own health. Right. Residency, like I get is a grind, but that's why residency is only like, you know, three to five years. Right. I get that it's a grind and that makes sense to me, but I feel like even attendings and fellows and all, you know, are are all yeah, I definitely think it's a bit of a myth that things end after residency. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It is truly like that you're grueling three to four years and then things miraculously get better, then sure. I'm not deluded to think that after residency, things are going to suddenly become a lot better. They're going to come with their own challenges. Exactly. Yeah. Did you guys read the article in the New York Times about how, I think it was written by a doctor who was saying how he has a duty to his patients, but he also has a duty to his wife. He also has a duty to his family and his kids to try to maintain his safety in the setting of being drafted to work in the emergency room. I think that that's a completely valid thing to say. Like everyone has their own things. Like maybe someone values their role as being an ED physician or whatever more than their role as a wife or a husband or whatever, or keeps it the same. But I completely agree with that. I don't think it's wrong to put your family above your career or even at the same level as your career. And I think that it's okay to make those decisions. Kind of going back to what you were saying, like, do you think that we could never talk about this without feeling guilty about it? I feel like it's okay to say, I prioritize my health or my family's health, or I do not want to work for the 11th, like, I don't want to cover for the 11th weekend in a row because I want to spend time with my 
friend. I don't know if we're quite there yet. I don't know. Like, I just think about my friends that are in consulting or IT and like the fact that a golden weekend is a weekend. That's a typical and, weekend for them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And just for our listeners, a golden weekend, if you're not in medicine, is a regular weekend. <laughs> so it's, it's having Saturday and Sunday off, um, which, <laughs> which isn't always something that we all get. For the most part, a lot of people in medicine tend to have maybe one day off a week, and it's not necessarily on a weekend. Nothing like a Wednesday off. <laughs> I think it fundamentally just brings up a good point here that often it's normalized to stretch yourself so thin because that's what we see. That's what the people around us are doing. It becomes a norm in the expectation. But I think that's something that we've really got to start changing. And it's something that people have to feel a little bit more comfortable talking about without fear of retaliation from their employers as well, which is a whole nother issue. And you mentioned the goodwill of physicians being a little bit limited, but what's unlimited in a lot of these cases is the guilt that we can feel when we bring about these things and the guilt that people can say, you're not willing to take that extra call shift, but what about the patients? Yeah, no. And, and I think the other thing is it's not just about the patient. It's okay. If you're not going to do it, then I'm going to make your colleague do it. And I think that that is also the upsetting part because when you're sick or you are not able to, someone else who's stretched just as thin as you are has to cover for you. And then that could be the straw that breaks the camel's back. So I think that that's also the other difficult and frustrating thing about the system that we're in, where the people that are covering us are our friends and colleagues that are also in a similar situation. Yeah, absolutely. On that note, Sarah, thank you so much for being on this podcast today. Really enjoyed having you here. Stay tuned for our next episode on Shrinking Burnout. Listeners, we want to hear from you too. Feel free to email us at shrinkingburnout at gmail.com on any feedback, comments, or if you want to be featured on the show. And for everyone still listening, we want to remind you to take care of yourself. Take the time today to do one thing that you enjoy, no matter how busy you are. Shrinking Burnout is a podcast about furthering the discussion of clinician burnout and recognizing the resilience and hard work that many clinicians regularly demonstrate. Nothing we say on this show should be taken as medical or psychiatric advice. All of the opinions expressed on this podcast are solely our own and do not reflect those of our employer.